Good morning and welcome to the Linus Rare Earths Investor Briefing for the quarter ending 30 June 2024. Today's briefing will be presented by Amanda Lacaz, CEO and Managing Director. And joining Amanda today are Gardin Sturzenegger, CFO, Daniel Havis, VP Strategy and Investor Relations, and Sarah Leonard, General Counsel and Company Secretary. I'll now hand over to Amanda. Please go ahead, Amanda. Good morning, everybody. I see we have um, plenty of people on the call, which is always um, a delight. Um, during the quarter, the first shipment of mixed rare earth carbonate left Kalgoorlie. Um, after the incredible challenge of constructing that plant on the previously very constrained timelines, this was certainly a milestone to be celebrated. Um, but frankly, we were all just a bit too busy to spend much time celebrating. Uh, I think that the quarter could best be described as one where our internal focus remained firmly on improving efficiencies, reducing costs, and continually challenging ourselves to find new ways to improve and flourish in a tough market. And of course, to continue to deliver on our growth projects, which will deliver extra capacity, but will also, importantly, deliver greater efficiencies, improve safety via new automation processes, and new revenue and margin via initiatives like our new DYTB separation circuit in Malaysia. I think everyone on the call knows the price of NDPR is um, stubbornly sticking at five-year lows. Um, we all knew it would come off its very highest highs, but um, these lows really reflect continued slow conditions in the Chinese economy. And we watch with interest as we see the various economic initiatives being taken there. Uh, despite those low prices, um, we're pleased to continue to report positive operating cash flow. That reflects our ongoing commitment to continuously improving our cost competitiveness. And we are confident that um, alongside Northern Rare Earths, we're the only two firms that um, can be uh, profitable at these price levels. Free cash flow, as pointed out by some keen observers, I was reading one of your reports yesterday, um, that is after CapEx is negative, but that's not surprising given the large capital projects that we are still completing. And that is our choice as we continue to prepare for future market growth. However, as also identified by certain keen observers, we are not accelerating the Kalgoorlie ramp up as we may have done under different market conditions. Um, during the quarter, production volumes were down, but actually well aligned to the market. And um, we continued to meet all customer needs um, from that production and a slight reduction in the inventory that we held at the end of the previous quarter. The bearing failure in Malaysia was not forecast, but really, you know, on reflection, was not completely unexpected. As one of our people noted, uh, he had been working for over 10 years, God rest his soul. Um, with the extra capacity coming online at Kalgoorlie, we now have the opportunity to plan some additional work at Malaysia, which is consistent with the age of the plant. And we will provide some further updates on that when we um, deliver the annual results at the end of August. In some other exciting news, which is canvassed in the report, we now have Kerry Mining on site. Kerry Mining is first Aboriginal um, <coughs> owned business in Australia. Um, Daniel uh, originally set this up um, about, Daniel Tucker set this up about 30 years ago. Um, it's very exciting to have them involved. Um, Daniel is part, grew up in the Laverton area and has a strong connection to country. 
Um, they bring with them new kit, which is you know really um, quite exciting to see on site, and the um, deployment of, of people and, and equipment to site has gone very smoothly, and we look forward to a long and productive relationship with Kerry. During the quarter, we also announced the very efficient um, implementation of a new um, circuit in Malaysia to separate our dysprosium and terbium. Um, <clears throat> these are materials which are required in high performance magnets. And um, we have the, the great benefit, of course, now in Malaysia of being able to continuously um, improve and enhance the operations at that plant now that we have um, you know, sort of confidence about our ongoing presence. And then of course we had and we've included at least one picture I think the energisation of um, stage one of the Mount World expansion and um, great progress on phase two. Um, it, it, it's for any of you who have visited Mount Wells, coming to visit now, you will see that um, the site really looks very different from what it's looked like over the past decade as we complete this really significant um, expansion. Work on that project is proceeding very well and um, you know, we're, we're, we're really pleased with the fact that stage one will be um, uh, fully commissioned and tied in with current operations over the next um, few months, which will allow us to progressively increase uh, Mount World output as we de-bottleneck the dewatering stage. And then of course Kalgoorlie, and I'm sure some of you will be um, at Diggers and Dealers in a couple of weeks, and I know that you will be very um, uh, impressed by this facility. Um, I was there a couple of weeks ago, and uh, it really, it, it's, it, it, it is a thing of beauty to see um, a, a brand new um, sparkling plant. It's even better to know that it is operating as designed. And, um, you know, we've got a number of uh, initiatives there which, which really go to this point about efficiency and automation. We mentioned one of them in here, which is the use of what we call rotainers, which are basically bulk in, in containers, um, which we fill at, 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 uh, at, at Mount Wells, so we don't need to have the manual labor to fill the bags, and which then are fully automated, operated by someone with what really looks a bit like a uh, Nintendo game console uh, <coughs> to lift that container and um, uh, tip it into the hopper uh, and then bring it back down. So all really very exciting. Um, <coughs> we are approaching the end of our very heavy capital investment phase with Mount World expected to complete this year. Um, the LAMP industrial plan, the continued enhancement of um, you know, our facilities in Malaysia on track, and the Cal ramp, Kalgoorlie ramp up proceeding. Um, we will continue to focus on pushing operating costs down. Um, key areas of focus in that include um, clearly, uh, everybody here who even knows a little bit about mining will know that recoveries um, equal margin. Um, we have significantly lifted recoveries at each um, of Mount Weldon and, and Linus Malaysia. And as we bring on our new, uh, particularly at Mount Weld, our new facilities, we will be able to con you know, improve that further as we bring in our uh, fine grinding circuit. Last night, you would have seen that we released um, an announcement um, with respect to uh, signing contracts with Zenith as a um, uh, build an, uh, builder and operator of um, a gas-firmed hybrid renewable power station at Mount Weld. And that has always been part of that program is to identify ways that we can, as we increase our energy consumption, 
do it in a way that is consistent with our um, ESG objectives. So all in all, um, a fairly, uh, in some ways, an eventful quarter, very much focused on ensuring that we continue to improve our business so that we, you know, remembering that our business is not about what we produce, but it's about what, um, how much money we make. And so really we are managing all of our activities at present to ensure that we um, maximise uh, margins and, and profitability in what continues to be a, a very challenging market. And with that, I am happy to take questions. Our first question comes from Chin Jian of Bank of America. Please go ahead. Um, good morning, Amanda. Thank you for taking my questions. Um, three questions. Um, three questions from me, please. Um, so, Kangaroo are the um, heavy additional heavy rares um, capacity um, from from um, Malaysia. Um, I'm just wondering how should we think of the the total heavy rares you can produce from from Manuel, which won't change. Does that mean the heavy rare earths you are going to you are going to produce from US going to be um, um, reduced? How should we think about the phase stock? Thank you, Amanda. Um, uh, thanks, Chen. Um, so at this stage, uh, we we are considering uh, feeding both facilities um, with with material from Mount Will, but we are also um, <clears throat> discussing with the various different uh, projects which are focused on producing um, materials which have heavy rare earths in them um, about potential future supply. Uh, as you know, there are many projects, there's um, relatively little production outside of Southeast Asia at this stage, with the exception of one firm in, in, in South America. Um, but we are actively engaged. We certainly um, would like to see uh, additional material come into the market, but if not, we will see from our Mount World um, deposit. Right, thanks for that. Just a, just a follow up, Amanda. Do you have to change your Mount Will? Um, mining plan in order to do that? We will, um, and I think I've flagged this previously, I think that, you know, over the past decade, we've primarily mined, as, as miners will, for grade. Um, however, with the additional drilling that we've done, particularly over the last couple of years, we have a much better understanding of our ore body by element as well as by grade and so we do have the opportunity to become much more sophisticated in our mining plan and to mine by element um, <clears throat> uh, as well. So that will allow us to really look at ways to optimise the, 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 the amount of heavies within our, um, within our mining program. The other thing is that you know, over over the the last number of years, you know, at, at, as we talk about recoveries, our absolute laser focus has been on NDPR recoveries. Um, the current process does not work as as um, efficiently for our heavies, and we're doing a lot of metallurgical test work at present to increase the proportion of heavies, particularly DYTB, that we recovered through the process and it's it's highly prospective and we're pretty confident about being able to improve recovery rates as well. So, so together, the, the, the optimising the mine plan and improving the recovery rates will give us, you know, um, a, a much better uh, profile in terms of feedstock. Sure, sure. Thank you so much, Amanda, for 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 your color. Um, maybe last questions um, on you know on the um, sulfuric asset um, from BHP's um, nickel waste closure. Um, understand that BHP will continue um, you know to supply um, the sulfuric asset 
by importing from the state bond market. I'm just wondering who, who's going to bear the cost of importing? Is that on BHP or on Linus until um, 2027? And then, and then what's the plan yeah. after 2027? Thank you. Um, uh, okay, so we, we are um, actively engaged in discussions with uh, BHP at present. Uh, as you would appreciate, some of those are actually commercial and confidence. We will provide a further update. Suffice to say that, in as we indicated, um, BHP we have a contract with BHP. It is a contract which requires uh, best efforts to continue to um, supply us. Even you know, right from the beginning, it always conceived of there being times where imported acid would be required alongside that produced from the smelter, because of course you know there were major uh, maintenance shuts which were going to occur at the smelter in any case, um, and I think you know we have the 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 you know direct relationship with BHP. I think also that most people would be alert to the fact that. You know, we are not the only sulfuric acid user in WA or indeed the only sulfuric acid customer of BHP. And so there are industry um, initiatives looking at how does this logistics um, chain get you know, rebuilt so that it works for inbound, not just outbound um, sulfuric acid management. So look, we're working on it, Chen. It's not... Um, you know, it's it's not as easy as our sulfuric in, in in Malaysia, which is literally over the back fence. But um, you know, we we are confident that we can find a pathway through. Sure, sure. Thanks, Manda. I have more questions, but I will be um, um, passing now. I'll I'll be back to the line later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Austin Yun of Macquarie. Please go ahead. Uh, morning, Amanda and the team. Two questions for me, please. The first one is on the, the downstream production in Malaysia. I uh, understand that one of the accounts was offline for one month. I'm uh, just keen to understand how should we think about the uh, production ramp up and the production profile for the next six months. Come back with the second one. Thank you. Okay, so um, Austin, as I just indicated, um, it is a timely reminder of the fact that uh, you know we we properly um, you know in the period when we had the challenges on the license fully depreciated the the cracking and leaching um, plant uh, in Malaysia and um, you know operated uh, R and M on the basis of recognizing that it might be a, a, a time bound um, facility. Uh, it is now time for us to um, reconsider uh, what needs to be done there for a plant which is you know a decade old in you know I think most people would say fairly uh, you know sort of the environment it's a hot and humid environment um, you know the the facility itself um, is, is you know sort of uh, quite challenging and so we are our maintenance team is really assessing um, all of these items actually a bearing failure is not something that they can easily predict but um, looking at how do we make sure that we do all of the work which is necessary to set this facility up for the next 10 years is the key task of our, is the key task of our team in Malaysia at present. Um, I will give you a further update on that um, when, we, when we announce our annual results at the end of August, but we certainly you know this is the area now that we've got Kalgoorlie online that we do have, um, some headroom in terms of capacity, so we will make our plan to optimise production and to align it to market conditions. Okay, thank you, Amanda. Just just want to clarify um, to make sure that my uh, I understand it properly. So, um, are you expecting to do a more major maintenance at the Accum simulation? So, which means lower production rate and higher capex 
for the uh, next six months in Malaysia, uh, while the um, the production uh, shortfall could be met by the Kaguli ramp up. Is that the right no. way to understand it? Um, no, I don't. Uh, almost, um, but uh, the first thing is that we have a, and we've already um, indicated to the market, um, and uh, what we we call the lamp industrial plan, which is about um, you know optimizing, improving, maintaining, etc., um, the lamp facility. And so um, any capital um, will be um, uh, covered within that envelope, so you don't need to be putting in additional capital into your plan. Um, the way that, I mean, none of it is sort of like um, tomorrow urgent, it just is work that needs to be done and we have the opportunity now to be able to schedule accordingly. And once again, because the market is, um, muted, let's say, that's a nice word, um, we certainly have the opportunity to um, make sure that we plan in a way that is aligned with the market rather than just pumping out as much NDPR as we possibly can. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, my second question is around the, um, the sulfuric acid. Uh, just try to understand the asset usage intensity, like uh, if, you know, for one ton of concentrate processed, um, would the consumption be around 1.5 to 2 ton of asset? Is that the right way to think about how much asset you need? And also, do you have any plans to to build your own sulfuric asset plant beyond the medium term? Thank you. Um, so we don't actually disclose how much acid we, acid we use. It is a significant input into the process. Um, do we build our own um, sulfuric acid plant? Uh, very expensive. Maybe if the government was keen to gift us some money, maybe we might think about doing it. Um, but it is certainly part of the assessment of, of um, potential uh, options for ongoing supply and was always part of our thinking, which is one of the reasons why we um, set the initial contract, um, you know, to get us through early stage um, commissioning and operation and gave us the opportunity to really look at a variety of other solutions for that sulfuric acid requirement. Um, so, yeah, I, look, that's all I can tell you at this stage. We will provide further updates as we move through this process. Thank you, Amanda. I'll pass down. Thank you. Our next question comes from Paul Young of Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Thanks. Morning, Amanda and team. Um, Amanda, a few questions on the market. Um, pretty strong, I think, um, of you coming through that you're only going to ramp up as demand and the market improves, which, which I think is sensible. But just um, a few questions around your inventory. Uh, NDPR inventory. I think you had 500 tons at the end of the March quarter. Did you continue to build inventory um, in the June quarter? And also, um, to build an inventory, that decision was that a voluntary decision, or you're, are you actually getting some pushback from some from some of your customers saying they can't take the volume? Oh no, no, no. We deliberately built the inventory because um, uh, I mean, we had customers, we had demand for anything that that, that we produce. Um, some of that is from um, customers who, who are inside China, um, but we have a very deliberate strategy to not sell into the spot market. And um, we also have a, a very deliberate um, strategy to not be selling material that others may put into inventory and hold for when the price improves, you know, I mean, when we can actually afford to carry that inventory ourselves. Um, for some of us, uh, we can remember selling NDPR at $29 a kilo in 2016. I think that Paul and I both had this tattooed on our foreheads. At that stage, we didn't have the option um, <clears throat> because, you know, we, we were on a knife edge in terms of cash flow. Today, we have the option to choose to hold the inventory until the price improves. Um, we did actually reduce the inventory by a couple of hundred tonnes during this quarter. 
Okay, that's that's good to know. And then Amanda, just on um, you know future offtake with expansion, you've had this question a few times. I mean, there's still quite a few emerging growth companies um, who are stating that you know they 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 believe they can sign higher fixed price contracts. Um, you know, in the order of eighty to one hundred dollars a kilo, um, uh, with uh, you know emerging magnet producers and existing magnet producers, um, and um, uh, so, and we know, and you stated that you know, no one's making money at fifty, sixty dollars a kilo, and we know that nothing really works um, as far as the high quality projects unless you got, you do have an eighty dollar a kilo long run price. So, the question I have though is that um, do you have the ability to actually and the flex to actually potentially go sign fixed price contracts, high fixed price contracts with non Japanese magnet producers, i.e. Germany, in Germany, in Korea, in the US. Do you have that do you have that ability to go and sell fixed price contracts to non Japan non the non Japanese magnet industry? Sure, absolutely. And uh, you know um, I won't comment on other people's assertions except to say that we actually run a business, not a spreadsheet. And um, so we have contracts with European customers um, and we have some of those which are, you know, I know people sort of talk about these as their new pricing um, models. We have some which are fixed price, we have some which are floor ceiling and we have some which are, you know, sort of pegged to the published market price. We've always thought that the best way for us to be able to optimise um, pricing was to have a portfolio of, of pricing um, constructs and we continue to have that today. The only thing that I could tell you is that um, we do engage with all, um, you know, sort of both magnet makers and magnet buyers, you know, sort of the, the large magnet buyers. Um, I have yet anyone to say to me, oh, you know, I'd be delighted to sign a fixed price contract at $80 a kilo. I mean, I, I could assure you that we would have that signed, sealed and delivered within hours. Um, so um, I, I think that recognising that as the market changes over time, so too do customers' expectations and part of the art of selling is to understand the right time to strike those relevant contracts. Um, there are things that I think will improve um, some of the, the buyer activity including the most recent um, critical minerals um, uh, regulations which are being brought in by the EU and I think that that does provide further opportunities for us to um, engage effectively in that market. But um, I, I think that anyone who thinks that we just make stuff and then whoever feels like buying it for whatever price they feel like buying it, um, that we sell it to them. Um, doesn't truly understand the level of uh, focus and attention this gets in our business and I think that you can see quite clearly in the results that we consistently deliver better outcomes than um, than uh, just the, the published market price would suggest which reflects the fact that we don't just sell spot at spot price to whoever happens to ring up that day. Yep, okay, thanks Matt, understood. Um, just last one, just on the numbers, maybe bring your Gaudens, Gaudens into it. Um, just on Kalgoorlie and the cost there, are you still capitalising or is it included in the 131 million um, on, uh, in CapEx or, or, or actually expensing within the 84 million um, in, the, in, the, in the quarter of OPEX? We are still capitalising. We expect to reach a stage where we would meet the accounting requirement that would allow us to then uh, move it off the capital account and into um, operating expenses. Okay, great. All right, thanks Amanda. Thank That's you. It. Thank you. Our next question comes from Daniel Morgan of Baron Joey. Please go ahead. 
Uh, hi, I'm Andrew and Tim. Uh, so I understand the ramp up of your business uh, is subject to market conditions, which absolutely makes sense. Um, uh, should I expect that production should be at about a 7,000 ton per annum run rate until the market improves? Is that about right? <laughs> um, so I, I think that's an excellent question, um, Daniel. Um, you will have noted that we rarely give um, detailed guidance on on production and it's not my intention to do so today. Having said that, we are absolutely alert to, you know, sort of the various um, uh, statements that we've made over time, particularly with respect to Linus 2025. And we feel that it is important in this coming financial year that we demonstrate our ability to be able to uh, produce at those sorts of rates. But we will make a choice on when we do that according to market conditions. Okay. Um, should, I, should we expect um, uh, quantitative expect guidance are, at the... Sorry, Daniel, I, 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 will, I won't be too cute about it. You should expect that we are not going to start, um, at, well, we have not started the year and said, okay, let's go for 10,500 tonnes this financial year. Clearly, it would not be uh, a sensible thing for us to do with the market the way that it is at present. But we are keeping a close watching brief on inventory levels within China. Um, there has been some destocking, and um, as we see more of that occur, we will make decisions about um, how we, uh, you know, dial up or dial down our, our production. Okay, that's sensible, of course. Um, on China, uh, what do you make of um, the latest China government policies on the industry there, and you know, what does um, greater control there? or consolidation there um, mean for your business? Uh, however you want to answer that question. Um, generally speaking, um, when, when the China central government exercises more rather than less control, um, the market does appear to operate more functionally. Um, and so that that sort of seems at, at odds with an underlying belief in, you know, sort of free market activity. But there are many dynamics in the Chinese market, many more than just what the central government does, there's what state governments do, there's, you know, sort of, you still have um, some independent producers, particularly of of, of uh, you know, a lot of independent producers of magnets, you know, so you can have um, a variety of different um, dynamics, all sort of not necessarily going in the the, the same direction. Um, and we saw this, you know, in in 15 and 16 with the you know sort of really significant production of of, of it, illegally produced, i.e not licensed um, materials. And when the, the, the government stepped in and really took control of that was when you started to see the, the, the market function more rationally. So uh, on balance, um, is it a good thing for the Chinese government, uh, given the Chinese environment and ecosystem, um, we would see it as probably more likely to be positive than negative, but you know, um, it's difficult to forecast what will ever happen inside China. Suffice to say that the Chinese industry is, um, you know, other than as said on earlier, you know, our, our assessment is Northern Rare Earths and Linus are. Um, you know, able to to continue to be profitable because of our low operating um, costs, and I think that the that there is a, a a recognition that the always has been in China that the industry is important for China's economic success, 
and will continue to um, um, continue to take actions to improve it. Uh, thank you. Um, just last question: um, Has MREC and I, I mean um, Kalgoorlie sourced MREC? Um, has that made it through the back end of the Malaysian plant as of yet, or is that still to come? Um, not yet, but um, it's it's on site. It's unloaded. It's uh, it, we're sort of working on the basis of um, we we just have to. Uh, manage how we batch it through in the first instance so that we've got the um, opportunity to really assess it but we we've got nothing at this stage which makes us any more nervous than you ever are when you start a new process okay thank you so much for your perspectives Amanda thanks Daniel thank you Our next question comes from Dim Arushin from UBS. Please go ahead. Thanks, thanks, Amanda. Um, first question from me, just on the heavy wear as an announcement that you made um, a, a while back. Is there anything you can do, say, uh, to help us uh, quantify that uh, the revenue uplift uh, and give you some value for it? Uh, that's my first question. Um. We not really. Can I ask? A, 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 I know it'd be hard. Maybe I'll, I'll ask it um, differently. I think I know the answer, but um, I, guess, I guess why now? Um, 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 maybe I'm missing something. I think I know the answer, but um, this is an option that was available to you years ago. Um, or is this something that you're doing now because of where the market's at and you're just trying to um, optimise, I guess? Okay, all right. So the answer on that, well, first, first up, we will get a margin uplift from separating DY and TV, right? And, and you know, it, it will, bearing in mind that they're still relatively small volumes, I don't want to, you know, sort of overstate it, but the benefit to us from being able to separate our own DYTB is that we are able to then offer magnet makers and other higher, there are some higher value sectors um, that, that utilise those materials. We are able to offer those materials um, either as a package with our NDPR to magnet, magnet makers or otherwise. So it is about enhancing the product range as well as improving the margin that we are able to generate from that material. Um, bearing in mind that these days, and I know that there's lots and lots and lots of discussion about DYTB prices alongside all of the discussion about NDPR prices, um, but you know, uh, five or six years or ten years ago, you typically used um, about one to ten, I think it was even higher than that previously in high performance magnets, um, a ratio of about one to ten HRE to NDPR, DYTB to NDPR. That's actually dropped back to about one to 14 these days. Um, you know, a lot of focus from um, magnet makers and magnet users on ways to continuously improve their magnet and their magnet coercivity, you know, so mag magnetic properties above 100 degrees. So, so it, but it remains an interesting market, and for us, the ability to um, to generate full value from the materials within the Mount World ore body is and always has been key to our strategy. Why didn't we do it earlier? Um, well, for a variety of reasons. Um, when we first looked at this, um, on, on my watch anyway, we didn't do it because we didn't have any money. Um, then uh, as we, we moved through, we, we 
then you know sort of hit 2018 with some of the challenges with the um, license situation in Malaysia. Um, you guys would have you know um, uh, hung me if, if if we sort of talked about making a, a, any sort of significant investment in Malaysia with that hanging over us. We have clarity on the path forward in Malaysia. It's by far the most efficient way for us to enhance production, and so that's what we're doing. Is that the answer you thought, Jim? Uh, uh, um, maybe I can try a little bit more. It's, it needs to go into a cell. Um, so if I assume a 40% discount to, um, uh, with, with, you know, so SEG to, to heavy rare earth, does that um, narrow to 20%? Um, uh, I guess it's maybe too early to uh, figure that out, but... Um, I, I don't yeah. have that number off the top of my head, Dim, sorry, but I'm sure that Danielle and Gaddins will be happy to have a bit more discussion with you to give you a bit more on that um, off the call. Yep, yep, cool. And, and, and then maybe another question, uh, just uh, helping uh, quantify, um, but with the sulfuric acid issue, I guess the first thing is um, um, I don't expect there to be any issue or do you expect any issue for sulfuric acid um, or, or the availability impeding the ramp up? And, and again, uh, rough numbers. I know you, it's um, um, you know you can't give us tons or usage, but uh, for a pie chart, if it's 20% of your costs now, um, just just for us to assess how material this is your cost base, I guess going forward. Um, yeah. Okay. So it won't impede the ramp up. Um, uh, whilst the you know sort of ramp down at the smelter is is you know relatively short term, um, there will be um, plenty of sulfuric sulfuric still sitting in that tank for a while afterwards. Um, we have enough headroom to be able to um, manage this uh, transition, so. Um, you know, we're good with that. Uh, and in terms of financial effect, um, you know, there are, we won't know that until we've actually resolved some of the logistics. So I'm sorry, but you'll just have to be a little bit more patient on that. Kalgoorlie, I think it's, everybody knows that to operate facilities in Australia is more expensive than to operate them in, um, uh, Southeast Asia and so we continue to work on ways to optimise our cost base and a fair bit of that is associated with logistics and um, we have some good plans to continue to improve that as we move forward. We do need the Kalgoorlie facility to be more efficient um, you know, in terms of cost and it is really at the top of our list. So having got the plant working now, you know, a lot of our, uh, our focus switches to improving cost competitiveness. Um, and sulfuric will simply just be one of those elements. Yeah, cool, thanks. And just one last quick question. Uh, um, just on, uh, so I think Daniel and the others, so, um, uh, tried to get the best on, on the ramp up, um, just uh, in particular with Mount Weld expansion. Is that on time versus, uh, I guess, your original guidance, or stage two a little bit behind schedule from my read? Is that? Um... Oh, it's a little, it's a little bit, but the actual project is going really well. Um, we did a, have to 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 do some additional surveys as part of environmental um, uh, approvals earlier this year. Um, once again, it's all about the market. You know, if the market was strong, then we would, um, you know, put our foot back on the accelerator, you know, all the way down to the floor. But, but it's not necessary to do that right now. And speed always, you know, has some sort of cost associated with it. We think that the program as it stands works very well for us in terms of aligning to the market. 
as said, it's really important to note our current bottleneck at Mount Weld is the dewatering circuit. The stage one of the expansion is the, the, the dewatering circuit, so it allows us to release that bottleneck. It also um, replaces an area where we've always had um, challenges in terms of safe performance and it automates that and, and takes human bodies out of the operation of our filter circuits. And so, you know, that will actually give us an interim step up and that interim step up we think will be sufficient for this financial year, which is the reason why we are now looking to complete, you know, by the end of the financial year rather than, you know, I think three years ago we were originally targeting sort of the end of the calendar year. But we don't see this as being um, anything other than properly aligned to our general business plan. That's great. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thanks. I'll pass it on. Thank you. Just a moment for our next question, please. Next question we have from Milan Tomic from JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks and morning, Amanda and team. Uh, just a question, the reconfiguration of the Malaysian solvent extraction circuit to produce heavies. I think you mentioned that that was going to take some NDPR oxide solvent extraction out. I'm just interested in, in, in that ratio. Um, if I can put it in another way, if you get to one and a half thousand tons of heavies, does that take out one and a half thousand tons of MBPR oxide production, or if you could just provide some colour on that ratio, it would be great. Hi, Milan. Um, sorry, that that is maybe a little bit misleading the way that that's been stated. Or I'll just check on how we've stated it because the intention is not to indicate that we have any reduction. In fact, we're increasing our MDPR production rates at Linus Malaysia. So currently, um, you know, the circuits are configured to produce, oh, sorry, up until now, the last um, six months, circuits were configured to produce about 7,000. We have done the work on two of our um, trains to take that up to about 9,000 and we will at uh, you know the right time do the additional work to take that up to 10,500 10 uh, and, and potentially even 12,000 tonnes of NDPR. The, as part of that we put in some new circuits in our um, new uh, MREX receival area and so that has freed up some of the circuits that were previously used for NDPR separation and those are the ones that we're now repurposing for HRE. So the introduction of the HRE certain separation does not have any effect on our plans for the ramp up of NDPR capacity. Great, thanks very much. And just uh, another one on the heavy strategy. Um, the US rares update from August last year, I know it indicated an operational target time frame of FY26. Um, that recent update on, on the Kwantan heavies um, strategy, I think you mentioned that you have production um, starting there mid, midway through calendar year 25. Are you able to just step us through the, the latest thoughts on sequencing of these two projects? Um, so the, of course we can do it much faster in, in Malaysia because we have a brownfield site and um, you know, as I said, we're repurposing those particular circuits. It's also exclusively DYTB um, and a bit of holmium separation. Um, it's a more complex facility that we're talking about in the US and um, we are, you know, continuing to progress with all of those pre-construction activities, including, um, you know, sort of the, the the design, the the review. We're working with our U.S. government partners on that. Um, in the meantime, the sooner we get the DYTB out of Malaysia, the better for everyone. Yep. Thanks. That's all for me. Thanks. Thank you. Just a moment for our next question. Next we have Matt Hope from Ord Minette. Please go ahead. 
Yeah, thanks for that. Um, just um, hop back on to uh, Malaysia and Kalgoorlie. So just uh, first with, um, oh, sorry, Texas. Well, first with, uh, are you still planning to send the heavy rare thread that residues from Malaysia to Texas? Because uh, as you noted, there's really no third-party MRAC likely to be available from South America until you know, 2028 at best. And it's just puzzling to see how you could produce 3,000 to 3,500 tonnes of heavies from Mount Weldor alone without those heavy residues. Um, so, I'm not sure what you mean when you say the heavy residues. We produce SEG, um, which is a heavy rare earth compound in Malaysia. We do expect that... Yeah, that's what I was referring to. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, we, will, we will use some of that as feedstock in the US um, and we will... Um, uh, you know, the current plan is also to feed the US with the mixed rare earth carbonate from Kalgoorlie. Um, and once again, that will simply be optimised at, at, at the time um, according to demand, um, bearing in mind that, you know, uh, as said, demand varies over time. And, and I think this is one of the things which is really important once again, I go back to, you know, we run a business, we don't run a production plant and, and understanding what the market needs, when it needs it and when. And the fact that we produce, you know, materials which are used in technology applications and that varies over time. So we see demand for DYTB going certainly a lot, you know, a long way into the future. US government sees the importance of that, which is why they're supporting the development of that plant. Um, we, are for, you know, we are fortunate that we have heavies in our deposit, um, but we are very happy to complement that with heavies from other sources as they come online. Okay, and so there's no um, requirement for the government to produce a certain production level, uh, given they're funding it? No. Right. Okay, and the second question was just, I was wondering about whether there'd been any evolution on your plans uh, for Kalgoorlie about how to manage that high capacity over the longer term. And <laughs> do you know yet whether production can be flexed downwards and uh, remain cost competitive? Ah, so yeah, they're good questions. Um, at present, we're really focused on getting it to um, target rates. Um, is our initial target to get to nameplate? No, our initial target is to get to an interim production level that we see is consistent with the market and allows us to be cost competitive. But as I indicated before, as we, as we ramp the facility up, um, we now are starting to um, switch focus into what can we do to improve efficiencies in that facility um, and ensure that it doesn't carry a cost penalty compared to the material that we take through Malaysia. Um, it, it, that will take some time, but um, is very much, you know, sort of our focus as we get the facility operating. All right, thanks for that. Thanks. Thank you. Well, we're just about on the hour, Maggie, so I think unless we've got anybody else in, in the queue, um, we're probably... We have. Okay. We have one more, uh, three more questions. Would you oh, like to... Sure, sure. Okay. I can't see the questions, so yeah, so that's fine. No problem. Our next question comes from Shannon Shinha from Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Oh, hi, Amanda and team. Um, again, towards the end, so a lot of the questions have been answered. But um, I thought I'd ask around the Mount World CapEx, just given that we saw the increase at Kalgoorlie CapEx last quarter, um, how that's running. Are you still confident uh, in that CapEx budget? Um, yes, if we weren't, we would have disclosed it, Shannon. Uh, so yeah. uh, okay. it, it, it's running very well. Okay, and um, I just had another question around the hybrid renewable energy at Mount World. I was wondering, it's obviously good from an ESG standpoint, but is there any impact costs from that at all or is it pretty much in line with what they are currently? Um, so 
as part of the Mail World um, expansion, we increase our energy draw by about, I'm not going to say the number, because, uh, but, but significantly, right? So um, if we take that, and we indicated this in the announcement, if we take that and we assume that that is, is served by a diesel power plant compared to being served by the solution that we've got, the cost per kilowatt hour is significantly reduced. So compared to, de to today's energy draw, um, you know, the cost is higher because today's energy draw is much lower. But, you know, bear in mind the Mount World expansion processes four times as much material and we also have um, a quite energy uh, hungry fine grinding circuit which allows us to reprocess some of the material which, 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 which we've currently got in the tailings and it allows us to improve recoveries. And so this is a very cost effective solution for that increased power requirement in the future. Great, thanks for that. That's all from me. Thanks, Emily. Awesome. Thank you. Just a moment for our next question, please. Next, we have David Dickerbaum from TD Cowan. Your line is now open. Thanks, uh, Amanda and team, for hanging out a little while longer. Um, I, I wanted to ask just one more on the heavy rare earths. Um, should we view this as a, a strategic attempt to, to perhaps open more commercial avenues for your business with new customers and new areas? Or is this perhaps just taking more control over your product over time so that you would have future optionality? And I'm trying to get a sense of how imminent maybe this commercial opportunity would be? There are new sectors um, that we don't participate in at present because we don't have um, separated DYTV. And then of course there are our existing customers which is in the making of magnets. Um, and so uh, some of the new sectors which includes you know, in uh, the electronics uh, market um, are very attractive to us and it gives us an opportunity to expand into those areas. And then of course, as I said, for our existing uh, magnet buying customers, um, being able to offer them, you know, sort of a, a package of, of NDPR and DYTB um, is, is potentially of, of significant value as well. Appreciate that. And then just a, a little bit on the details. Just curious with the uh, the grant money that was received this quarter, was that specific to Australian projects from the Australian government, or is that how you're accounting for uh, some of the DoD support for sea drift build out? Um, I will get um, Gavin to confirm this, but that is a combination of grant grant monies received from both the Australian and the US government. Is that correct, Gavin? It's a purely uh, uh, Australian uh, project. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. There are no other questions on my side. I will now pass back to Linus. Okay. Well, once again, thank you all. Um, uh, I would just reiterate that you know, the market is is um, not as not as hot as it was a couple of years ago, um, but we remain very um, uh, we remain completely aligned with the medium and long term view that it will continue to grow, um, and therefore we continue to develop our business to be able to meet that future growth whilst really focusing on ensuring that we are profitable even at the lower price and more muted demand levels that we're seeing today. So again, thank you for your interest in our business and I'll look forward to speaking with you again um, in a month or so when we release our annual results. Thanks. Bye.